Ann Maloney, food writer for NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune, and I am at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum with Justin Nystrom and Liz Williams. And Justin recently wrote um, a book that is uh, dear to probably Liz's heart and mine, since we both have a Sicilian and Italian background. It's called Creole Italian Sicilian Immigrants and the Shaping of New Orleans Food Culture. So we're here at Southern uh, Food and Beverage Museum, uh, so Justin can make us some spaghetti sauce. That's right. Even though he's not Italian, we decided to let him do it. Um, we reviewed the recipe, we approved. Oh, so. okay. Well, I'm glad I've got the blessing. So right. you are an associate um, history professor at Loyola University, and you're also the director for the Center for the Study of New Orleans. Center for the Study of New Orleans. So you've done a lot of research and, and and study on the history of New Orleans. And of course, Liz is director of the museum, and she knows a lot about Southern food and its development. So we're going to make spaghetti sauce here today. We're going to share the recipe with you later. We're also going to talk a little bit about how Sicilian and Italian immigrants had an impact on New Orleans cuisine and something that we still feel today. Right. And is this what you consider a Creole tomato sauce or is it uh, more... This is a good family red sauce. Okay. This is... Uh, you got two uh, little boys, right? I do have two little boys and, and they eat. They love my spaghetti and meatballs. Mostly the meatballs. They, they tend to... Two-year-old flings the spaghetti. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're a frugal cook, which I like that too. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really, this is a, a pretty basic recipe, but that um, actually reminds me a lot, except that it's a quick cook recipe. It's not the old long simmering red gravy. We can make this in about a half an hour, right? That's correct. We should be done in 30 minutes, 30, 35 minutes. And um, I am a frugal cook. I like, I mean, I don't like to waste things. I'm the youngest of seven kids. Mm -hmm. Grew up that way. Um, and what I like about spaghetti and meatballs, it's like chili, it's like gumbo. You can put your own spin on it. There's no one single way to make it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, you wrote that article a while back about the $125 a week for the mm -hmm. groceries, and that's hard to do. It's a challenge. It is. Um, and spaghetti sauce is one of those things that allows you to use up bits of this and that, okay. uh, and, and just like a gumbo can, too. Okay, yeah. well, let's get started. All right. So tell, tell, talk us through as you're going, and I'll interrupt you and, and, uh, and pull you off into different directions as you... Uh, Great. Well, I've got a hot pan here, this um, not very clean Le Creuset roaster, and I'm going to put a very carefully measured amount of olive oil in it and uh, get that nice and hot, and it's smoking. It's probably turned down just a tiny bit. And I've got a vegetable mix in here. I did all this chopping at about 6.30 this morning. It's a red onion. It's a yellow onion, a Vidalia, actually, a uh, bell pepper, um, a carrot, Mm -hmm. which is a very Italian thing to do yeah. to, to sweeten your uh, sauce a little bit with it. Um, and it adds a lot of body. And so I've got also chopped garlic in there, about five cloves of chopped garlic. And no celery? I, you, can, you can add celery. Mm -hmm. uh, you can add, um, you know, when you're getting back, you know, a lot of times if I've got some button mushrooms in the fridge and they don't last right. super long, I'll go ahead and cook them up and toss them in the freezer. And, um, and then, you know, when they're going, I'll put some yeah. mushrooms in, cooked. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to have them roasted ahead of time or, or sauteed ahead of time before they go in. Uh, bell peppers, if bell peppers are going bad, I'll, I'll roast them and freeze them. Okay. And then in they'll go. Uh, if you like roasted garlic, I, I'm not a big fan, but some people really like the flavor of roasted garlic sauce. Um, that's a great thing to put in, slough, celery, all, all manner of things, really. I take the garlic from my seafood oil and I freeze it. Oh, yeah? And then I throw it in my spaghetti. That's a great oh, idea. That's really nice. And onions, too. I like uh, I like garlic from the seafood boil in potato salad. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's absolutely. Really that's very yummy. Yeah, yeah. So that's a lot of vegetables. It so is a lot of vegetables, and it's going to take a little bit of time to cook down. Okay. Uh, this is a fairly hot stove, so I think that won't take too long. We're going to let that sit. Um, I don't put any uh, salt in this at this time because I want that to caramelize okay. uh, a little bit. Uh, if we had a little more time... Uh, another thing you can do is just like caramelize this down more. You know, really take the time and just the veg let the vegetables do the work of the darkening and deepening of the flavors mm -hmm. and bringing out more. The darker you get it, the sweeter it will be. And uh, but today, you know, uh, when we puree it later mm -hmm. with my my immersion blender, mm -hmm. it gives it a lot of body. You know, uh, which you might do otherwise with a roux and a red grape. Yeah, yeah. great. Well, let me. Well, well you're going to go to head. Start I, the I'm going to start doing some meatballs. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me. Let's. Let me. Let's. While you're doing that, you're going to. You're going to take. This is three kinds of meat, right? Right. It's veal, pork, and um, beef, and um, the, the classic three meat. And okay. we're going to. It's about two and a half pounds. We're going to put a. I make my own breadcrumbs at home. Old okay. poor boy bread, very New Orleans, or French bread. Uh, I've got a little reserve there. I'll put in some 
uh, local grocery store chains, um, a very careful measure. Again, this is, these are the kind of things that you do to taste. Right. And um, we have we have our own blend of uh, Italian seasoning. Right here at the Southern Food right Beverage here. Museum. Right here. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 9 dollars on sale? No, so no, 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 no. We, we put, uh, we put ground fennel in it oh. uh, because uh, it gives it a really nice kind of reminiscent of Sicily smell and taste. So I use, I'm a big fan of, of the microplane. I put in some chopped garlic bits because I kind of like that in the meatball, but I also like the oomph that a little microplane garlic mm -hmm. puts in there. Uh, you got to be careful with your fingertips, of course. Right. And, and, that um, gets it really nice and fine. Nice though. and fine, and it's very powerful. You know, I was talking to Mary Sunnier of Gabrielle mm -hmm, Restaurant, sure. and she said one of the kitchen gadgets she would never be without is her microplane. And okay. she uses that a lot. Yeah. And so I used it actually twice here. Um, Toss in those big chunks, and then in uh, a microplane, the Romano cheese because it, it has a lot of loft. That's a lot of cheese. It is a lot mm -hmm. of cheese, it's beautiful. and it's like a cloud. it is like a cloud, very fluffy, and, mm -hmm. and, and that means it'll mix in with the meat really mm -hmm. nicely. Uh, and I, I put in some Worcestershire, a little bit of red wine, and of course salt and pepper. Um, the old Peugeot pepper mill that was a graduation present from my parents 30 years ago, nice still going, know. yeah, still going strong. And so they knew that you were interested in food even then. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and I and actually my first car was a Peugeot, so there was something like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> that nice trip. He's always been a little weird, right? Uh, so, so yeah. So uh, one of the things when I was looking at your um, when I first saw your book and I thought it was called Creole Italian, it seemed like the perfect title to me. It seemed like yeah, sure, Creole Italian, something we always talk about here. But what, what does that mean to you? What? Well, when I say that, I mean, I know I, the word Creole is loaded. Lots of people have different definitions of it. So what do you mean when you say Creole Italian, especially related to New Orleans? Yeah, the word Creole is kind of loaded. I, if you've never been to the State Museum, they've got a little video there of experts in the field who I know, and they all give their definition of Creole. It's a little video, and what's great about it is there's nine different people, and they all give a different definition of what Creole mm -hmm. is. And I think Creole Italian is the same way. You know, one of the questions I asked, and I, I, I recorded many interviews for this project, and I asked them, what does Creole Italian mean to you? Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of perplexed looks, you know. And then maybe some, oh, well, you know, we, we add more pepper, more seasoning into our Italian food mm -hmm. and, and, and all that. And, you know, I actually found a lot of people didn't actually have a really great answer for that question. Okay. And um, I do mean it in an ironic way uh, because... You know, when we think about New Orleans, those of us that live here, the image of ourselves that we market to others, it, Creole is a, is a calling card. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been that way uh, ever since George Washington Cable was writing uh, his novels and people were walking around the French Quarter trying to find the places located in them. So it's, it's something we've done for a while. Even though when you think about New Orleans, it's really an immigrant city. Mm -hmm. um, Creoles were... Uh, not to go down the academic rabbit hole, but Creoles <laughs> were, a, were a demographic uh, minority by 1830, a huge demographic mm -hmm. minority. 1850, uh, over half the city was foreign born. A lot of Irish. The Sicilians hadn't come in big numbers yet, mm -hmm. but they were already here uh, importing lemons. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Creole Italian, the irony is, is, you know, the Italians start cooking Creole food first. Uh, they get involved in the restaurant business, they have mm -hmm. oyster saloons, and um, all kinds of uh, enterprises, and, and you know, they're cooking pompano. They, mm -hmm. they serve uh, gumbos, they, they lot oysters any different million thousand ways that they make them, right. oyster soups, turtle soups. It's not really until the 20th century that they're starting to serve people Italian food. Mm -hmm. I, mean, the, I think the perception is, is that Italian food is... Uh, Creole Italian food came about as Italian food that was modified. It was actually the other way around. So they were cooking foods that people were accustomed yeah. to in New Orleans because they wanted to attract New Orleanians to their restaurants, Cor to their oyster houses. Cor correct. Okay. Yeah, and so so you know when they start adding, it's it's the it's the Italian dishes that are additive. Mm -hmm. You know, and and but I mean it also in an irony in that the the Italians really. In, the, in, in that food way, subsume their own culture to the dominant culture that they find here. And they write themselves out of the story. Mm -hmm. And it's not until the 20th century when, when Americans in general are starting to celebrate what Italian, being an Italian-American is, okay. you know, when more and more Sicilians in particular start coming to New Orleans in the 1890s. 
we see a critical mass. Spaghetti becomes popular. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes a national food in the, in the teens, but not before. Okay. Yeah. So you talked about the oyster houses in the book, and I thought that was really interesting. It, it was a, a really started some of the first sort of, what did, what did you, how did you put it? Um, um, talked about being fed right away. Talked about like the restaurants at one time were with boarding houses and that sort of thing. Yeah, so if you, if you know, we, Shut Antoine's is our, our, our oldest restaurant, but it's really not a restaurant in 1840, it's a mm -hmm. boarding house, mm -hmm. you know, and there are a lot of boarding houses and they serve meals at set times to a group of people that they know are gonna show up. Right. And so the essence of a restaurant is walk up service. And these come out of two things, catering and boarding houses. And so catering, if you can think about cooking in the summer in New Orleans mm -hmm. without running water, uh, when you have to start a fire every time you want to cook, right. you know, carryouts make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And so people gain a reputation for the culinary talents as caterers, and, um, and then they start opening restaurants where they actually are, are waiting. And, and this happens when you have enough theaters and billiard halls and so nearby. So the city has to go up around it and mm -hmm. then... Hotels. It's the first restaurants are really in hotels. Okay. Yeah. And so. How, so how did the Italians get into this whole idea of, of um, forming some of the early restaurants in the city? Why, why do you think that they gravitated toward that? Well, who do we see as the bedrock of restaurants today? The immigrant class. Mm -hmm. It's a hard job. Right. And Even it doesn't always require that you speak the language. Correct. That's yeah. true. Correct. Absolutely. That's a key part of it. Uh, families working together mm -hmm. often. And this is, you know, they have the family. They had uh, a shared interest. They had a willingness to work. They were in a country where they weren't being stolen from. Mm -hmm. These are all good things. <laughs> and there is, there was also a Sicilian food culture. Yes. So food was something that was Absolutely. a central thing. Now I've got meaty hands, so Liz, if you get the oven. So these are going in the oven? Yep. How long about? about? Uh, 20, 25, 20, 25 minutes at okay. 375. We'll get nice and brown on the outside. They'll okay. be still tender on the inside. Um, this has been sauteing along. I don't know how long we've been rolling, uh, but they're starting to get a little more softer. softer. Yeah. I would let them go a couple more minutes. Okay. And so let me quickly get yeah. this meat okay. off my hands. We can just pump some. Perfect. So um, tell me a little bit, I mean, you worked on this book for a really long time. What, I did. what, what was the impetus? What made you decide to, you know, you've written about um, uh, the history of the city. You've talked about the history of the city. Why did you feel like this was a, a part of the city's culture that needed its own um, history book, I feel? Although it's a, a little more than that. Yeah, right? well, you know, my first book was on Reconstruction Era in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and I wrote a lot about Creoles mm -hmm. in that book. And, you know, uh, so much of our story is, again, the uh, title, going back to the title, a certain irony, the story we want to tell is the Creole one, and that it has to be Creole to be worth telling. Mm -hmm. And so I make, made it Creole Italian because I'm saying, you know, these are Italians and they're worth talking about, right. in, in a way. And um, a very close friend of mine, Peter Massoni, probably many people watching this will know him, his, his father was a doctor, a uh, well-known doctor here, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, he grew up like both you both with um, the Sicilian upbringing and um, my parents are Chicagoans. Mm -hmm. Again, another city with a great ethnic core and there was always so much about New Orleans that reminded me of places like Chicago. And people rap, rap on Cleveland, but Cleveland's a great city, I'm just gonna tell you, with kind of really great ethnic neighborhoods, all kinds of really awesome ethnic food. Um, and it reminded me of these really great Midwest cities that had this rich immigrant culture, but we weren't really writing about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and we weren't celebrating it. We were telling the same story, the antebellum South. We were talking about Creoles, as interesting as they are, um, that that New Orleans history needed to grow up a little bit, and be more mature. And and I think we're starting to do that. You know, we're starting to tell more stories about New Orleans now, and I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, do you think that there is a place for the word Creole? Can that still mm -hmm. morph into a, um, a word that can? Say mean New Orleans. I think absolutely, and and um, and I think we need to be careful how we use it so that it retains that value, right? It's like when everything is Creole, nothing is Creole. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we use it more carefully and think about what truly is has that it's a cultural marker and it's really important, mm -hmm. you know. 
if, if we use it on everything, it's like it, it's like artisan. You know, you can go to McDonald's and buy an artisan-made sandwich. And I'm sure the person making it don't really think of themselves as an artisan, but there you go. You know, uh, and so like in a way, we're saving Creole by not overusing. It. So how did you begin working on this, and who are some of the people that you talked to? Because, I mean, you, you're talking about the fact that there was maybe some information about Italians in New Orleans or their contributions that either had never been explored, or maybe there were some some little mythology or things like that that happened naturally when we think about our ancestors and our, our culture. Right. So how did you make sure you were being authentic? I know you're a historian, uh -huh. so I'm not trying to insult you. But no, no, no. <laughs> no, well, uh, authenticity is a spongy thing. So now I'm putting in a little salt because mm -hmm. this is going to start letting it give off some of its moisture. Okay. I put salt in there. I'm going to put some pepper in. And, um, well, I gave a talk in June, and I was like, you know, so when I say Sicilian, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Of course, everything mafia. Right. And, and and of course here I, I remember when I was talking to when you brought me to go talk to Joe Segreto, you know, late Joe Segreto of Eleven Seventy Nine, he said, No uh, this is my Joe Segreto voice. <laughs> You're not gonna do one of those who kill other chief things, are you? He was really sensitive about uh -huh. it. And I think rightly so. I mean Joe was the real deal and he had all these, you know, aspects. Uh, great stories to tell and share, and he was also very knowledgeable mm -hmm. about food in general. Um, by the time I got to talk to Joe, I'd already kind of gone through. I really wasn't going to write the Who Killed the Chief book. You gotta because, say what that is. Well, the, the, the lynching know. that followed the assassination of the Chief Hennessy. This becomes what Sicilian New Orleans is about, you know. And I was asked to do a, uh, a radio show, and that's all they wanted to talk about. Like, no, I'm just not going to do the show, mm -hmm. you know, because right. that's what you want to talk about and perpetuate. And there's so much more to be told. Mm -hmm. And and so I started in talking about groceries. And my very first interview was actually Roy Zapardo. It was a part of his grocery. Mm -hmm. And he gave me this really great interview. I filmed it. I was really upset with myself because there was a crooked picture in the background. It bothered me visually. But, but um, so I'm going to put in some of uh, you know, the dried Italian season, which, which is available here at SoFet. That's right. Um, also this place, too, which I find myself going to often enough. Um, I'll go ahead and stir that in, and, and I'll let that get a little hotter. Um, maybe turn that up. So, so you tried to find, you not tried, but you found um, Italian Americans, Sicilian Americans who have lived in New Orleans for generations or had their family had moved here. Um, Abs absolutely. And, and, and I think it's worth noting here, I just wanted to give a call out to the Maselli family in the Italian American uh, Renaissance Foundation, or um, um, Italian, American Italian. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong, uh, Frank. I'm sorry. It's but the Italian-American American Museum down there on Peter Street. <laughs> yeah, she did. But Joe Maselli, you know, his dad went out in the 1970s, and he knew the immigrant generation was dying off. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a pro, you know. He was he was just an interested amateur, and he had a little tape recorder, and he went out and did these interviews because everybody loved Joe, right? And so they were willing to give an interview, and he recorded this really rich history, a couple, you know, a couple hundred interviews. Mm -hmm. Usually when people go and do this, they do, like, five right. and then their ambition level wanes and they stop but he bequeathed this with this amazing trove of knowledge that was going to be lost and so there were things to build on okay and i wasn't planning on really even talking about restaurants okay you know mm -hmm. and and then I, I talked to joe i'm like oh you know my head exploded of course i have to talk about mm -hmm. restaurants and so a book that was going to be focused on corner groceries and making groceries mm -hmm. and stuff like that started talking about restaurants and then I was thinking wait I need to talk about wholesale food mm -hmm. in the French market in Decatur Street as it was in the late 19th century when it was the hub I was talking about farming mm -hmm. you know southern Florida didn't exist in the in 1900 okay they're growing their vegetables up here in Kenner going up Illinois Central to Chicago and they were Italians doing it, you know southern California southern Florida as we know central Florida didn't exist as we know it. This was a truck farming capital of the region. Okay. All this and stuff we is gone. Sending, we, we? Like, people in, in Canada were sending their food to other cities. And oh, it would come here. Them. It would come here either to the French market and feed this big metropolis, mm -hmm. or it would go and um, I'm gonna okay. carefully and measure out some wine. Yeah. Oh. So you put a little wine in your meatballs, and you put a little wine in your I do. Sauce. I do. Um, I never did put a timer on those meatballs, but we'll, our nose will tell us okay. about when they're getting done. Um, and so, so we're we're in good shape. Yeah. 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 
I think. There's, there's a little bit of time they, they need. Yeah, oh yeah, they did, they did. Um, so yeah, and, and talking about, you know, people coming into town, but also the Illinois Central runs right through Jefferson Parish mm -hmm. and, and uh, St. Charles Parish and then heads north paralleling I-55 up to Chicago. Metro New Orleans fed Chicago, which in the late 19th century was the fastest growing urban center ever in human history, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we grew their vegetables. So tell us, tell us a little bit about the, the macaroni factories. Yeah, so macaroni is a fun thing. Of course, we talk about pasta. and. You know, there really isn't a lot of noodle production here. There are some, the Langles factory, which is kind of over where the convention center is today, um, produced vermicelli noodles, which were a little bit different than what the Sicilians are gonna come and produce. Um, but in 1898, there's a tariff, the Dingley tariff, and it makes imported goods, all kinds of imported goods, a lot more expensive at a time when there are a lot more Italians here. There's an internal market, and so you see this flourishing of macaroni manufacturing, particularly in the quarter, I believe, in 1900, 1902, there are eight factor, big factories. There are a lot of little factories, a lot of little backroom mm -hmm. pasta production, but eight big factories, and seven of them are run by Sicilians in the French Quarter. Okay. Yeah. If you go to the Le Richelieu Hotel today, uh, that was built in 1902 as a pasta factory by the, the Guzamano family. Okay. Uh, yes. and, and so really, but it was really a tariff that made imported pastas things like that more expensive that make people really say, well, we need to make our own? A, com a combination of that, but, but then the, the, the macaroni market grows exponentially because Americans discover noodles. I mean, again, people, had, it's not like they were unknown. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson is one of the first people to import mm -hmm. a press. Uh, but over time, I'm, I'm ready to put my sauce in here. Okay. So I'm gonna do that. So Thomas Jefferson doesn't create a food trend when he does that. But what happens is in the first decade of the 20th century, we start seeing absolutely non-Italians starting to come down to Decatur Street, where all of a sudden these spaghetti houses, in the very, very end of the 19th century, when this pasta dome occurs, start serving what they advertise as the real Italian spaghetti. Okay. And this is your red sauce, red gravy, whatever you want to call it. We don't know exactly whether it was sauce or gravy. I'm going to tell okay. you that right now. <laughs> um, we don't know a lot about these places, but we do know that non-Italians are starting by 1910. Uh, the Amelone and Todd Prices actually are even starting to write about them. And, and um, they're coming down and eating this spaghetti. It's... it's it's inexpensive, it's, as we know, delicious. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things is, you know, this, it's not like this, right? It doesn't come in a little box that, what, what is this, maybe a foot long. The spaghetti noodles are, are, you know, maybe a yard to a meter mm -hmm. long because they're dried, they're hung over a wooden doll mm -hmm. in the factory. And so in 1908, at the old St. Louis Hotel, which of course uh, is destroyed in September of 1915 by the hurricane, um, they have banquets there and they get the Messina Spaghetti House to cater it. And it's all these mortgage bankers. They're, you know, the homestead, homestead, which is, you know, mortgages of that time. And they're people from all over, and they're coming, and they're very excited about the spaghetti dinner, but nobody knows how to eat it, because <laughs> you're, you're trying to eat this thing, and the reporters, you know, get great mirth, because they just don't know how to... Um, all these sophisticated people. Right, right. You know what, Liz, I'm going to hand you these. Those all can right. go take a swim, all I right. think. Do you want me to do all... all yeah, let's do the whole pack. Okay, so you're just going to go ahead. Now, this I'm is gonna something I never, ever do, but I get it. I would, this is the difference between cooking it down, probably, and doing it more quickly, because this way you can get kind of a full body in your sauce without having all the chunks. And if you have kids, essentially, some of them don't have chunks. Chunks of onion and chunks of. I don't like chunks. You don't like chunks? <laughs> I don't like chunks. <laughs> I, uh, this is all about my authoritarian rule in the kitchen. Um, well, you know, actually, what I really like about this puree sauce with the little the vegetables and, and that mm -hmm. carrot especially really gives it this body and flavor. Is it does it sticks to things? Mm -hmm. It sticks to the noodles really well, and it's, it coats the noodles. Mm -hmm. Pretty awesome invention. I use it all the time. And, you know, and when, I, when we did a tasting of Italian jarred sauces, one of the things that we talked about with some of the Italians who um, 
people like Maria Campagno and uh, people uh, like the chef who owns Leonardo's on the North Shore is about this difference between sauce and gravy, and this is more of a sauce. It definitely is, although it, 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 it eats like a gravy yes. because it is very thick. Um, and, and again, you know, we're talking about being economical. This is a, a super economical sauce to make, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know who actually taught me how to make this sauce, in, in, or at least sort of in the Spain, is my brother. My brother is a very economical cook. He's one of the people that always saves all his vegetable trimmings and makes vegetable stock okay. and stuff like that. And uh, he's like, why are you buying jarred sauce? I, I'm, I'm ashamed. I admit it. I, buy, I bought jarred sauce. And he said, let's go make this. And so we Just got see some how easy it, it is. easy it is. Yeah. And, and um, I'll go and I'll, I'll for, I, this makes quite a bit of sauce. Uh -oh. See there, this is the next step. Where's that lid? <laughs> so at home, this is what you want. You want to kind of lid it up, let a little bit of steam okay. come out. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn this down, down, down. And uh, let it just kind of do its thing. It'll only get thicker uh, at this point. But at this point, it's ready to eat. What, what were some of the surprises for you when you were doing this book? Were you surprised by anything? The thing that surprised me was the origins, and, I, and I'm ashamed to say this. I should have known already, but to read about the origins of Commander's Palace oh, yeah, and yeah, the yeah. name change yeah, and yeah, all yeah. of that. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, it, it goes back to the earliest migration of Sicil ethnically Sicilian people. Uh, they're either coming from Palermo mm -hmm. or they're coming from the itty bitty island of Ustica, which is like maybe five square miles and is 60 kilometers north of Palermo. Mm -hmm. And these are fishermen and, and seafaring people. Mm -hmm. And they start coming to New Orleans in a large number um, in the 18. 40s and 1850s, and Maria Compagno, who we know mm -hmm. and, and is a wonderful person, she is actually from Ustica. She right. came in, I think, 1950. Mm -hmm. and, and she's sort of the tail end of that. And they are the families, the Camarda family, who operates Commander's Palace, or opened Commander's Palace, but also opened the Demonico. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were brothers. Um, and there's a lot of mythology about the Demonico, which you can read about right. in the book, right. and I don't want to get into the complexity no. of that. But they these are kind of glorified oyster saloons. They, mm -hmm. they cook deals, they have oyster loaves, they, they s start serving ravi, there's a craze for ravioli in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And so people want ravioli as something they can charge a little bit more for. It's not a particularly Sicilian thing, mm -hmm. um, but it they're getting, it though. looks fancy and they're serving it in New York and mm -hmm. New Orleanians are very much tied into what's going on in New York. And they open their place there on Washington Avenue and, 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 and I know T was, T Martin over at Commanders was, uh, you know, because they had their opening date a little earlier, which mm -hmm. dates from an old Lucius Beebe piece. And um, they, apparently they have an oops cocktail that they call the anniversary cocktail. And then they got the <laughs> date right. They sort of embrace their, the oops quality of that now, which, you know, T's great. She's a, a smart businesswoman and a really great restaurant, one of our great restaurateurs. And, and so, yeah, they started at some modest places. Over time, it grows. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they owned it till when did the... The Camardas own it until the 20s, uh, not quite the 20s, I think, and then the, the Moran family. It actually changes hands a couple of times. And then the Moran family, which has it all the way until the Brennans buy it in 1968. They buy it in 68. They don't actually start running it until 73, of course, famously, with the, with the family right. split. Yeah. But So th this is an Italian name that they basically took and, and Americanized, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know what I'm finding right now? I made a kitchen goof. I did not put my parsley in my meatballs, which makes me very sad. Yeah. You want to put it in the sauce? I am going to put it in the sauce, however, not all of that's it. That's all right. We'll, yeah. we'll make note of that when we put the recipe together. You can take it out of my pay. Yeah, that's right. I'll put a little the, fresh basil in there, too. Were there any other things that sort of just just information that you got? Uh, that you I didn't know anything about lemons. The yeah. Sicilian citrus trade was something entirely new to me. And, and, you know, when I was writing that chapter, the first chapter, talking about the lemon trade, which begins in the 1830s for a, a variety of complex reasons, uh, I'd be reading all this stuff about lemons, and I'd be sitting Oops, in, in our home office, and my wife would be in the same room working away, and I'd turn, and go, did you know? Mm -hmm. And she'd be like, let me guess, this is about lemon. <laughs> you know? <laughs> lemons are, I was reading all this horticultural literature right. about lemons, so that was a surprise to me. Um, that, so what it was, really, yeah. was that most of the lemons coming into Until the, the first decade of the 20th century, even in California, California finally gets its act together around 1905, 1910, and they get a tariff. In mm -hmm. 1921, the emergency tariff of 1921, and all of a sudden, it's not—it doesn't make economic sense. 
But it's the lemons why we have Sicilians in New Orleans and where we have them because they came on the citrus fleet. So the lemons and the Italians came together. Well, so you have the first wave of traders mm -hmm. uh, like the people of Stasi, mm -hmm. uh, like the Combagnos. And let's say you need to go to Ustica. Dot, I think it's Orgercom. But uh, there's a great Ustica genealogy site. And Maria Compagno is, of course, very involved in that. A really great, wonderful heritage site. Um, and so you have this earlier group of traders and wealthy merchants. The, the idea is that you know Sicilians were poor. Mm -hmm. well, that's just not true early on. They're actually very prosperous merchants, and they set up these trading houses along Decatur Street. And they are the rising generation. You know, we talk about who killed the chief. One of the reasons that they go after the Sicilians in such a hard way is they, they're jealous. Mm -hmm. These being the people who are in cotton and sugar and all these other dying uh, industries is the you know, ultimately tropical fruit, which will become the big money of bananas. bananas. Right. But you can't do that. They modernize the citrus fleet, and it's on this citrus fleet that Sicilians come to New Orleans because it's a long it's a long sail in the age of sail. It's a hundred days. Mm -hmm. You're not going to yeah. bring immigrants in, but when it's 29 days on the nose from Palermo to New Orleans, all this is cheap. So all of a sudden you see this in Yeah, of in the eight, middle of the 1880s mm -hmm. when the fleet modernizes and they branch out into tropical fruit. And the reaction to the city, um, to the uh, Italian immigrants, was mixed. I mean, people have sh different feelings. I know, you know, I've heard stories about the discrimination and the, a little bit of the hostility when you have a big influx of all one time people coming in to you. Well, yeah, it is it is mixed. It's more complicated mm -hmm. than that. Yeah. And I think I need to pour these out. Is that right? I, it, it needs a second of oh. sitting. Okay. And then I'll, pour, I'll do it. Okay, Liz. I'll be You're a sous chef for me there. This yeah. is a great honor. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, you have some of these early restaurateurs from mm -hmm. Ustica who are members of the Southern Yacht Club in the 1890s mm -hmm. at the same time of the Who Killed the Chief incident and um, the Hennessy lynchings, and you know they're they're in, they're they're in the society pages. Okay. You know, if anything about the Hennessy lynching that teaches us is actually it failed. It failed to put Italian Sicilian Americans back into their you know their recesses, if you will. Mm -hmm. They they are they weren't going to take it. You know, mm -hmm. they have become such an important part of the lifeblood of this city. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there was a certain amount of maybe silent acknowledgement that what had happened was really wrong. And we do start to see Sicilian Americans more and more embraced by the newspapers, talked about in a positive way, and their contributions to the commerce of the city, which is very significant. Okay. Yeah. I want to be positive. Did you want to have a, a look at I think I need, we need to do a test, a taste <laughs> test. There's a plate or something uh, we can grab. Now, or a fork. Oh, you know, there's the spoon. This will work. So let's check one of these out. Oh yeah. So those are ready to go. Okay. So do we put the? Do you put them in the meat sauce now? Or do you well, there are two things we can that can happen, and we're talking about being a frugal about food. Yeah. I actually tend to pluck all these off, and I put them in a in a Tupperware thing, and I freeze them. Individually, because okay. my sons will eat meatballs just by themselves. Right. You know, the two-year-old will chant meatball, meatball, and which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, before I serve them, I'll have the sauce. I, I I put them in the sauce. I get my pasta ready. I put the get these bowls, these big restaurant-style bowls. Put pasta in. Put ladle on some sauce and meatballs. Should I get a big platter? Or oh, something? we could totally do that. Yeah, that would be, be great. Great, great. yeah. These, these so are we should address right now that meatballs are not authentically. Sicilian. My You're grandmother American. my grandmother did not make meatballs. Yeah. She made meat sauce, she made stewed chicken, and really the, the meat was sort of a flavoring for the sauce. The sauce was the thing. You really start seeing meatballs in restaurants. Italian restaurants sort of first appear in the first decade of the 20th century. They get hot in the second decade of the 20th century. Pascal's Minnelli mm -hmm. is a really good example. Opens in 1913 from day one really to a tourist market. Mm -hmm. Tourists are coming to New Orleans because particularly regionally there aren't a lot of Sicilians in like Atlanta. Okay. And they're coming from Atlanta and they want to have Italian food. The real Italian mm -hmm. spaghetti. And so spaghetti and meatballs by the 20s are so mainstream that the ladies auxiliary clubs are going to Bourbon Street to eat at uh, uh, you know, Tucci's to eat mm -hmm. spaghetti and meatballs. And, and um, we, we start seeing advertisements for spaghetti and meatballs on there. But they're very American because of the American system of producing meat and affordable meat. American 
versions of all kinds of ethnic foods are much more meat heavy because this is the land of plenty right. and inexpensive groceries. Although we could argue whether that's right. still true. <laughs> yeah. Well, comparatively speaking. Oh my goodness. That no, was would beautiful. you like a ladle to bring that I would, into here? I would. I'm going to turn this off so I don't. So, what are some of the long lost um, Italian or Sicilian restaurants in the city that sort of made the name for uh, Italian cuisine? And then you, men you mentioned um, Tucci's on. Yeah. Bourbon. Are there are some others that. Yeah, well, Tucci's, of course, was on Bourbon. And it opened right next to where uh, um, Begay's or, or Tujac's is. I'm going to stir this up. That is. Yeah. And I just want to tell you all, it smells really, really good in here. <laughs> Even if I'm not Italian. You, know, well, you, you did a good job. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I haven't tasted it yet, but it smells very good. Yeah, I have, actually I haven't tasted the sauce at all. Normally I'll taste it. Yeah. You know, it's good to taste yeah. it for salinity a little yeah. bit, mostly salinity. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ladle some. Oh, this is a really impressive ladle. Wow. And do you want I could to knight somebody with <laughs> you this. Could. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, so, so, yeah, Tucci's, which, which eventually, you know, um, maybe some of you remember Ben C. Toledana, and they tried to rekindle that Tucci's fire with uh, Spaghetti Eddie's, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that didn't quite work out. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they, um, they were on Bourbon Street for a long time until in the 40s, like 45, 46, they moved to Poitiers, mm -hmm. which is where most living people remembers that re remember right. that restaurant. You know, I don't think I need much more sauce no, than that. No, yeah. and, and then tongs that can go in. And, um, I Shall I toss? Please, please, toss away. Hold it well, still. what about today? Like if somebody said, I want Creole Italian food, where, Liz, you can chime in on this too. Where would you tell them to go? What are some of your favorite places that you feel like sort of will scratch that itch for people? I just want to make one mention. Elmwood yes. Plantation yeah. was really, I think, important. You know, um, Dick Collin uh, really talked about that mm -hmm. a lot, and and it was to me the sort of pinnacle of those Sicilian American restaurateurs and fine dining, and really about how they ate or mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to bathe those in sauce. Yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. you want me to put them yeah. in there instead? Yeah, and, yeah. and then we'll oh, fish them. We'll fish them out yeah. and put them on. Yeah. Because what I like about it is you see how this, this sauce coats them. Yes, I see how and, it coats the spaghetti and, too. And, yeah. Which is actually makes it easier to eat. It does, if especially you've if you've like got kids. Sauce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, kids um, eating with their fingers. Right? Yeah. Um, I find my sauce actually similar in flavor to Manali's. I don't know if they make theirs this way, but I, I find the flavor and okay. color and the sort of brightness of this. They have a fairly bright sauce. Um, but uh, 1179, 1179, really the descendant yeah. of Elmo Plantation, right. which which many people, uh, all think all the people in this room lament mm -hmm. uh, the passing of that restaurant. And that's really when you ask that question, that's one of the things that comes to mind is like all the ones that are closed, right? Mm -hmm. Tony Angelo's, you right. know, all those places like that where you feel like, okay, I remember what that was, mm -hmm. but it's not there anymore. Right. And a lot of that had to do with the way they did business. You know, um, you think about Joe Marcello and, and the Marcello family that, you know, funded and owned a lot of these restaurants, but also Joe Marcello, front of the house man, um, in and all these places. The front of the house man, like Joe Segreto, I mean, Joe could do whatever in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. He was also really gifted as a cook. Mm -hmm. um, but the celebrity chef comes along, and a lot of these restaurants, they don't adjust to that kind of the way credit cards and right. everything else. Things change a lot. And, you know, like Sclafani with a menu with, mm -hmm. you know, 200 items right. on it in that old school kind of way. Um, those kind of restaurants become less popular, tablecloths disappear, mm -hmm. jackets disappear, silver plated, silverware disappears. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were about. They were also very traditional restaurants in that regard. And they didn't modernize and a lot of them closed. Right. And even things like having linens with you know, which were done in house, and all of that goes away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you lose all of that, all the identity of the and restaurant be becomes something that's unified and, and homogenized. But so. we still can eat Creole Italian. Anymore. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. So okay. let's yeah. let's put those get those meatballs on there. Absolutely. I'm eager. To, I'm and I suppose I should be getting some plates. Yeah, I was going to say we need forks at least. Oh, yeah. See, now that's a coated <laughs> meatball. It, gives, it takes that a couple minutes. Great, yeah. It takes a couple minutes yeah. for it to really get on here, but. 
So if you wanted to, if you didn't feel like cooking and you wanted to have um, Creole Italian food, what, what are some of the places you'd go to? And we're not, we're not going to name every Creole Italian restaurant in New Orleans, but I'm sure we're not going to name some people's favorite places. But what are some, you know, one of mine, I grew up with the Compagno family, so mm. that was one of the ones that I remember really well. And now it's Vincent's. Vincent's, yeah. Which Vincent's does a, you know, yeah. a, a credible job. Especially if you're too. uptown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Metairie too. Yeah, oh yeah, right, right, right. Um, you know, I, I got a soft spot for Vinitza. Mm -hmm. uh, and as an added bonus, when you go to Vinitza, you can go uh, down to Bricado's and get dessert. Right. You know, yeah, so you and, got your little. Yeah, it's a yeah. special night out, you know, for especially family dining. You can go to Vinitza at 5 30, and mm -hmm. nobody look at you funny. <laughs> and, and, and then head over to Bricado's and with your small kids. And still get the kids. kids in bed by 8. Yeah, <laughs> God willing. Yes, yes. There you go. All right. Thank you. What are some of your favorite clues? Do you have any? Venezia is absolutely my go-to place really? to be a, just the local Italian thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And uh, I always do what you say, and that's go-to bricados <laughs> um, yeah. afterwards. And um, there you go. And I also, let's see, where else do I? I mean, you know, there's Pascal's Manali. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go there also. Mm -hmm. um, but. I would say if I have to just have one, it would be the name to have. You, you know, I will say Mandino's in a lot of ways is reminiscent of how a, and it's a Sicilian restaurant would have been in 1920 mm -hmm. because they have a lot of those Creole dishes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's right. and like not Italianized Creole dishes. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they have Bruce Long. Right, right, as right. A spit, I, which is hard to find right. elsewhere, right. And, yeah. and and so I would have to give a shout out to Mandina's and that and keeping that alive because that's that's something that's really disappeared from menus, but you would totally see on menus in the teens and the twenties at these emergent uh, New Orleans Sicilian restaurants. But I would also go to Mandina's for red beans and rice. Totally. So, you know. Well, and they're serving those, you right. know, in the twenties, mm -hmm. absolutely, or seafood, or the the, the, the you know, um, chat manure and things right. like that. Right, soft shell crab on yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting hungrier by okay. the second. Well, we're going to dig into this, um, and we're going to see what kind of job uh, Justin did for us here. But I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. It's been and, fun. And um, I think if you're like me, and you're from New Orleans, and you have Italian descent, there will be things in this book that will be surprising to you. Um, things that maybe you didn't hear from your mom and dad that uh, help you understand a little bit better about how our culture, the, the culture of our ancestors, affected the city's um, not only our food, but our way of life here in New Orleans. It was an eye-opener, and I enjoyed it. Great. Thank you. Right. And this is good. Thank you. <laughs>